Well, welcome to the Business Spotlight Series. My name is Tanner O'Brien. I'm a senior partner here at Action Coach in Central Texas. And today I'm joined by Brian Whitaker, who is the founder of Zettabyte Content. So excited to be sitting down, Brian. I just want to first off say thank you for taking the time to, to jump in, have a little bit of conversation with me today. Um, you know, we're going to cover some topics. We're going to talk about entrepreneurship. We're going to talk about just business in general, some challenges, best practices, things like that. Really just you know, ideally share a sneak peek into what it's really like to, to be a, a business owner and build and operate a business, that sort of thing. Um, so just want to say thank you for, for taking the time to be here. Uh, I'd love, you know, maybe let's just start with a little bit of background. If you would kind of give us the you know, 10,000 foot view of, uh, of who you are, your background. Uh, we can dive into some you know, more specific detail as we, as we progress today and tell us a little bit about what, what is Zettabyte content? Sure. Well, for starters, Tanner, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's always good to talk to somebody uh, who knows the ins and outs of being an entrepreneur like yourself. And so to give you a little bit of background, I have been selling and marketing enterprise technology, stuff that goes in data centers, um, for over 20 years now. Um, I started back in 2002 selling server storage and networking for one of the biggest technology companies in the world. Um, and I did that for a few years, pivoted within that organization into marketing. Um, I was a marketing leader in Europe for a few years, came back to the U.S., was a marketing leader in the U.S. for a few years, and um, wrapped up my career at that company as a marketing director for a data storage product line that was worth about $2 billion a year, and then started Zettabyte Content. We've been at it for 11 years, working with business-to-business -business technology companies from startups to big fortune 100 companies and everything in between beautiful i absolutely love that um and we can kind of dive into some of the the journey there here in a few minutes but i want to kind of you know stay on on the business first um i always like to just set the stage for you know those that are uh watching this or listening to this later on you know we've got uh, a myriad of businesses that we've had a, a chance to connect with here on the series uh, so I always like to ask just some general questions around uh, kind of ownership structure. And what, what I mean by this is, you know, when you look at your business, uh, generally speaking, are you sole founder? Do you have business partners? Uh, do you have outside investors? Kind of just generally speaking, what does that look like for you and your business? Yeah, so I'm a sole founder. Um, we're, we're incorporated as an S-Corp, have been incorporated in the state of Texas for 11 years. Um, we've had some very small um, early investment. But really, ever since then, it's been 100% bootstrapped, and we've grown about 20% year on year, every year on a revenue basis. And so it's just continue to, <clears throat> continued to go strong without additional partners or outside investment. That's fantastic. Uh, so 11 years in business, continue to grow year over year. What does your role in the business look like today? Well, I'm certainly the leader. There's no question about that. Um, what we do is basically like any other professional services company. Um, probably the closest analogy is something like a um, very specialist um, sole proprietor attorney or a small firm of accountants. Um, what we do is we do a lot of consultative work with our customers. So I'm leading the engagement, managing teams of specialists, whether they're writers or marketers or graphic designers or whatever. Um, handling the day-to-day -day interactions with the clients and um, making sure the business is successful, making sure that we've got a viable strategy for the both the long-term and the short-term and overcoming obstacles as they emerge. Beautiful. I love that. Um, so let's, I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the business itself. Uh, you've kind of started to go through it a little bit in terms of the businesses that you've, you've worked with in the past. Uh, but, you know, when you look at today's market, uh, I always like to ask just generally, who do you serve, right? And kind of the, the way I frame this up is if I'm in the audience and I'm, I'm listening to this, how do I know uh, that either I would be a good fit to come work with y'all or I might know somebody who would be a good fit to come work with y'all? So I'll just kind of break that down. Um, so for starters, we are exclusively business to business. So we do no work with companies that sell directly or indirectly to consumers. Hmm. Um, so we are dealing with companies that build technology and sell those technologies to other businesses or other organizations like governments. Um, the work that we do is 
um, the, the products and services that are being sold by our clients are never transactional. They're always um, products that are very expensive. You know, they, they might start at $100,000 or $2 million. Um, they are purchased by a collection of buyers and influencers at the customer. The sales cycle could take 12 to 18 months. And so we are a very relationship focused company. We help our clients build better relationships with their customers so that the customer sees our client as a trusted advisor and um, has a long-standing relationship of coming to our client, asking questions, going deeper on technology so that when they're ready to buy, they recognize our client as the leader, the expert, the helper, and that's how our clients get sales. It's fantastic. So if you would um, kind of walk us through just a, maybe a general example of what kind of the, the work looks like when you got you know, a client, you're working through this process with them. Um, what, what kind of things do y'all uh, work with them on? Like, what, is, what does that kind of look like if you could? So you can kind of look at it in lots of different ways, but I'll see if I can do this simply. Um, what we try to do is we try to help our clients educate and persuade their clients, their customers. And so what we do is we try to get at what has happened with our clients, is happening with our clients, will happen with our clients around how their customers are using their technologies. So we're basically uncovering stories, if you want to look at it that way, hmm. and then elevating those stories and turning them into usable bits of marketing that educate and persuade. We can do that on kind of a strategic level. We find all the stories and then we craft what you can call a top level narrative about what the company does and how they do it, who they do it for and why it matters. And then that top level narrative gets spread out across every marketing channel, you know, web, social media, video, or we can do it more tactically. We can tell a story about what the company has done in a given situation. Like for example, you know, this technology is really helpful in helping um, retailers digitally transform. And so we'll create something or a collection of some things that make a difference for our client. Could be blog posts, could be um, infographics, could be white papers, could be a written case study, could be a series of those things. And we can help them also launch products. Like they've got a product that they want to take to market. We can figure out what the stories are around the product, who the product's going to serve, and then create all the different resources and bits of marketing necessary to take the product out to market so people can find it, learn about it, and buy it. Very cool. Um, absolutely love that. Uh, are there are there you know a lot of competitors to what you all do? Uh, are you fairly unique in the marketplace? Can I... I, I guess I don't know enough personally on on if uh, if there's others that do what you do, but you know, what does that look like for your industry? Well, it depends on what you're looking at. So there are God knows how many consultants and freelancers out there in the world um, chipping away, you know, wanting to do business with a you know a Dell or a NetApp or SolarWinds or all these other technology companies that are out there. Um, what we do is a little different than what a generalist marketing agency can do because I and the writers that I bring on board have subject matter, matter expertise in the technologies. Hmm. That's something a general, generalist agency never can bring to the table. And so what that allows us to do is come up to speed faster. It gives us a deeper understanding of what the tech can do, what the target market is, what the competitors look like, what the routes to market look like. And so we can execute better quality work faster than others. So that's the kind of generalist agency competitor. The other piece is the freelancer or independent consultant kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Their challenge is scale and stability. Um, there are a lot of people that go off and do the freelancer or independent consultant piece as a bridge between full-time job to other full-time job. And so if you go with one of those people, there's a fair chance that you'll lose them in six months. Mm. And so, you know, we advocate long-term engagement. We advocate consistency. You know, our average client sticks around for like 17 months. And so, you know, 
between the subject matter expertise on the one hand and the consistency and stability on the other hand, we do something that's different. Love that. I, that subject matter expertise is, is gotta be really powerful, uh, especially in kind of the tech space. Do you, I, I'm just curious, you know, it's from some of the conversations I've had with, um, other say very technical founders, they know their product very, very well. Um, it, has it been easy kind of bridge the gap between the technical speak of what the product or service can do versus what the, um, you know, the end user actually would you know, emotionally feel when making the, the purchase decision of those technologies. Um, can, if you could, I, I'd love to just kind of hear your thoughts on, on, on that, especially being in kind of the, the technology space. You know, Tanner, that's a really astute question. And I appreciate you bringing it up because it actually gets at the core of what we do. Um, there are a lot of technology companies that you would refer to as engineering led. They started with a technical founder who had a really bright idea. And that bright idea gets turned into something real. And then the technical founder typically finds other technical buyers who want to buy the product. And they recognize that the technology is awesome. They want to buy it and they buy it. That's great. And then that sustains the company for maybe a couple of years. And then they realize that they need to sell to a different audience that's not so technical, right? Maybe a business buyer. It might be a you know, VP of something, or even the CTO or the CEO gets involved mm -hmm. in the business discussion. And so what happens is the features and functionality of the product are not the key buying criteria. The key buying criteria becomes what does the company need to solve? What problems does the company have that the technology might map to? And how well does the technology map to the problems and opportunities of the company, mm -hmm. right? And that's a completely different conversation than what the technical founder is used to having. And yeah. so, you know, they'll come in and say, I just want to talk about the speed of the product. It's faster than everybody else's. And, you know, somebody in the C-suite or a board member goes, yeah, I don't care about that. What I care about is I've got this fundamental problem in the business. And I'm wondering whether your thing will help us or hurt us. Um, that's the piece where we play, turning those features and functionality into solving pain points, addressing challenges, unlocking opportunities, all of that. That's the bit where we shine and where we deliver value. Um, and it is a, um, you know, the reality of reality is nobody wants a product. Like nobody wants to buy a product. They want a solution to their problem, right? You know, I just bought a laptop. It's supposed to show up tomorrow. I didn't want to buy a laptop. I wanted to have a way of communicating with my customers and getting work done that was more reliable than the laptop I'm talking to you on. Mm -hmm. right? Just I'm trying to solve a problem here, right? Trying to you know unlock opportunities. The laptop is fundamental to what we do and how we get work done around here. And so that's the piece that really matters when a business is trying to scale past that first set of technical buyers into something bigger and shinier and more impactful. Hmm. That is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, the number of marketing conversations I've had with various business owners, but especially being here in, you know, central Texas, there's a lot of technical led, um, engineer type led organizations and businesses out there. And, uh, that, you know, that whole thing of, you know, people don't buy the drill. They want the, they buy the hole in the wall. Same thing that you know you were just stating there. Um, but you know, I always love to ask some questions around marketing. So this this kind of leads you know into marketing. It's an area that is vital to every business out there. It's often an area that you know business newer businesses especially tend to kind of struggle with unless they have a you know a massive um, you know background in marketing and um, loved that we had a chance to kind of dive into you know what it looks like uh, or at least a little bit of what it looks like to work with kind of your clients and things like that and your general philosophy around marketing. Uh, I'm curious for a business like yours, um, tell us a little bit about how you how y'all market your business and how you all acquire the the clients that you work with. So all of our clients basically live on LinkedIn, that's what it comes down to. And so one of our key strategies is connecting with and communicating with prospects on LinkedIn. Um, we do a lot of that every day in various forms and function. Um, 
And we do that in a giving manner. Like I'm not interested in spamming people to death. There's there's no value in that, and it's, it goes against my values personally. As but what I am interested in doing is helping these organizations get a broader reach. If I believe in their technology, I think they're doing good stuff. I want them to get a broader reach, and so you know I'll engage with the founder, or I'll follow their company page, and when they say something interesting or important, I'll amplify it. I'll send it out to all of my you know three thousand and something followers, and try to broker conversations. You know I have clients where they need a technology. And I'll think to myself, oh yeah, I just saw something going on here. So I'll connect the two of them. I also have kind of a concerted effort that's always ongoing of building out referrals and connections from clients. So, you know, I have a client who's a multi-billion dollar digital infrastructure company right now. And we're kind of like getting wrapped up on this huge project we've been doing since February. And I said to the CMO the other day, I need you to think of eight people you can refer me to mm. and I need you to do a video testimony. And, you know, and she's sort of said, yeah, yeah, of course, I'm going to help you do that. Right. Systematizing that and being really consistent about that has just paid dividends every year. You know, we've had customers that have taken us to three and four companies over 11 years because we just keep delivering value. And part of the value we deliver is that we think outside the marketing box and we just keep giving. We keep trying to find out ways to make their business better. Yeah, folks appreciate that. It's beautiful. Um, so I know we've talked a lot about the business and I, I want to make sure that we have a chance to kind of take a step back, talk about the journey into, you know, business ownership, entrepreneurship, all of that fun stuff. Um, you know, I had a chance to kind of hear a little bit about your, your background overall, but I want to ask you specifically around that transition into, you know, starting Zettabyte content. Uh, when you made that choice to, to start a business of your own, get into you know, this whole world that is business ownership. Uh, kind of talk me through why make that decision versus, you know, continuing to work for somebody else or, um, you know, was it exciting? Was it fearful? Was there a little bit of both of those types of emotions? What was, what was that like for you when you made that decision? You know, it was certainly exciting. Um, I had been thinking about it for a while. You know, I was a, I was a marketing director. I had in many respects, a a cushy gig, right? I, I was doing fine. Um, and I had a nice little team. They were really good, experienced marketers. But I kept coming across a, a sore spot. And it was simply that when I needed to augment or extend my team to do more work faster, finding the right people quickly in an agile way was really hard back then. You know, I would talk to our agency. They didn't have specialists. We talked about that before. I'd look at freelancers. They would be flaky or, you know, consumed or whatever. And so after about a year of sort of knocking my head against that wall, I realized there was a marketing, market opportunity. Mm -hmm. I realized that there was a gap in the market. And I didn't have any like grand ambitions. I didn't want to be a $100 million business. But I did recognize a couple of things about myself that were really important. Um, one was that, the role I was in was quite political. I was having a lot of political conversations, lots of meetings about that sort of thing. And what I really enjoyed was getting marketing done, making it happen for folks. And so my role was kind of taking me away from that. And the other piece of it was that I'm kind of insatiably curious. I'm always really interested in new technologies and what's happening in the technology marketplace. And my role had kind of pigeonholed me into this one, you know, this one product, literally. And I wanted to branch out. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to provide more value in a bigger space. And so making the leap happened. Um, I had found a customer that wanted some very basic consulting. And so I made the leap. And, you know, within a year, I had grown the business to the point where I had replaced my corporate income completely. And I was off and running. Fantastic. I absolutely love hearing those types of stories where, you know, the first year getting getting things off the ground and going and there's, you know, some, some early, early wins to keep things rolling and, um, you know, obviously has kept you in business and now 11 years running, you know, fantastic here. Uh, I'm curious, as you look to the next three to five years, you know, where's, where's the business heading for you? What do you see kind of, you know, down the pipeline as, as, as we look towards the future? So, you know, we've, we've really worked hard for the past 11 years in this kind of data center, cloud, edge computing kind of space. 
which is a huge, huge space. Lots and lots of players, lots and lots of stuff going on. And, you know, we all have these devices in our pockets, which are more powerful than the mainframes in the 1970s with a ton more features, ton more capabilities, right? But they rely on these data centers, tens of thousands of data centers scattered all over the place and more are getting built every month. And um, there's an emerging problem, which is in order for these data centers to function, they require huge amounts of electricity and they require huge amounts of construction materials and they require huge amounts of often in water. They consume, mm. they consume water for cooling. Mm -hmm. And you know the statistics are data centers globally are at the moment consuming somewhere between one and 2% of the total le electricity on the planet. Wow. And that's only going to rise, like it's increasing. And so last month we launched an initiative, I guess you could call it, to go deliberately work with companies that are aiming to make their data centers more sustainable. And so we're doubling down on that. Um, you can probably see over my shoulder a trade show badge. Just got back from a trade show called Data Center World here in Austin, where everybody was talking about sustainability and turning data centers into carbon neutral or even carbon net positive kinds of entities and reducing water consumption. And um, Gartner, who's a huge analyst, just came out last week and said that most organizations, only 5% of organizations have a data center sustainability plan, and in five years, 75% will. So we see that as an extremely active, innovative, exciting space, and we're going to spend the next three to five years prioritizing our efforts in there. Nice. I love that. Um, very clear focus, uh, big impact. Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, well, I, I know we've, uh, we're, we're coming up on, on kind of the time that we had allocated today. And uh, before we jump into the rapid fire questions, I, you know, I always like to ask just a couple questions or at least one question around team building uh, or at least hiring, recruiting, something to do with the, the team side of a business. Uh, so when you look at, you know, having a team, being a manager of, of teams in the past, having, having a team in your business today, uh, I always like to ask about training, learning, educating, continuing to, to grow the people within the organization. You know, what areas of training do you believe, you know, your people need the most over the next six months, either based on kind of where the business is headed or just the general business climate of what's out there today? Uh, what, what are you focused on with, with your team? So there are kind of a couple of things. One of them, of course, is um, new technologies, because we we thrive when we stay on the forefront of the new technologies, right? And so spending money to go and get a week's worth of training at the supercomputing trade show or data center world, that kind of thing is important to us. It matters. You know, it's one of the simplest and most concise ways for us to go and drink from a fire hose of information for a week and learn a lot about new technologies. Um, the second piece is new marketing tactics. It, hmm. The B2B marketing space is in a lot of change right now. It's going through a lot of flux. There are a lot of old tactics and techniques that are no longer getting the resonance in the market that they used to, and there are new ones that are beginning to emerge. And so we're spending money on training folks to become things like um, personal branding experts, you know, that lead executives down the journey of becoming thought leaders on LinkedIn and other platforms and getting their personal brands out because that translates into more attention for the companies. Um, we're also looking at training around um, using these new generative AI tools like ChatGPT, mm -hmm. Google's Bard, to accelerate and deepen and enhance the marketing that we do for customers and also being able to advise customers on which tools they need to use, how they need to use them, where the value is all that. Beautiful. Oh, those are massive, important pieces. And I 100% agree, the especially B2B, you know, ta tactics and marketing and things like that have, have definitely shifted, you know, in the last, even just the last couple of years, it's, it's been pretty profound to, to watch that unfold. Um, but Brian, you know, we've covered, certainly covered a, a lot of ground in the conversation so far today. So uh, you know, first off, for those that are watching, make sure you pause this, save it for later, you know, come back, rewatch it a couple different times. There's definitely some nuggets here that are worthwhile going back and, and, and rewatching, kind of taking some notes on things like that. 
Uh, but as we begin to wrap up, I've got a couple of rapid fire questions, uh, kind of top head answer. I know we could probably go deep on each of these, but uh, just kind of top head answers for each of these. There's four of them, uh, and then we'll kind of get into the final wrap up here. But um, Brian, what's your key to success? Consistency. Showing up every week, delivering the goods, providing value, making sure we're helpful, and then rinsing and repeating the next week. Beautiful. What's one piece of advice that you give to other business owners? Connect, particularly with like-minded business owners. You may very well find out that a challenge you're having is a universal challenge and other people have solutions you haven't thought of. Excellent. What's one book that you're either reading now or have read most recently? So I'll, I'll do a plug for David C. Baker's book on becoming a powerful advisor. Um, this is a guy who is basically an advisor to, a, to advisors, a consultant to consultants, a, an, an agency advisor to agencies. And he, um, he, he does a brilliant job of unlocking some of the deeper possibilities of what folks like me do. Amazing. If you had to choose only one area in your business that you could immediately throw some magic into and it improved tomorrow, where would you put that magic? I think I would probably put it on the sales piece of things. Um, I'd like to scale the business a little bit more this year. And we could probably do with a contract salesperson to go have some initial conversations, break some ice and move some things forward. Very cool. Well, Brian, this has been a lot of fun. I've got one question I'd like to wrap us up here. Uh, but before we do, for those that are watching, where can they go to find out more information about the business, about you, to follow you, to connect with you, anything like that? Where can we, uh, where can we advise people go for more information? So you can certainly look for me on LinkedIn. I'm there. I'm fairly prominent. I'm definitely busy. You'll find out lots about me and what we do there. And you can also go to our website www.zbcontent.com. Perfect. And for those that are watching, once we're wrapped up here, it'll be in the video description below, uh, LinkedIn profile, website, all of that. So make sure that you go click connect, uh, go through all of that fun information. Uh, but Brian, final question I've got for you today as we wrap up things here. What is most inspiring to you today? You know, what's most inspiring to me today is that we are on the forefront of making the planet better, solving some intractable challenges in the technology space around sustainability. And there are lots of brilliant people coming up with brilliant ideas on how to have it. And I'm really grateful to have a, be a small piece of that puzzle, to be in, right in the center of it, trying to make something better happen for our technology companies for our communities and for the world. That is truly inspiring. Brian, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I know we could probably sit here for another 20, 30 minutes and just uncover a whole bunch more incredible nuggets of wisdom in your experience in business and growing and marketing and everything else. But, um, you know, just thank you for sharing what you've shared with us so far today. I uh, highly encourage everyone goes and connects and learns more information about you. Uh, but thank you for taking the time. Tanner, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for it. It's been good to talk to you.